hey, the live streaming seems to work. Just say good news. Uh, I'm going to put that on Twitter as well. Hey, let's get started. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to DTD London. Our guest for tonight, Ian, will be talking about functional domain modeling in, in F Sharp. Ian is a software developer and a speaker for a number of years now, and he's focusing on strategic domain driven design and F Sharp as a language. And I believe uh, he's going to show us how to express our domain models nicely using the functional approach. Uh, in this interesting language. A uh, couple of things. We are streaming this, uh, this session on YouTube. Uh, I posted the link in the chat. Uh, so if you are not comfortable with being on the stream, uh, then I just want you to, to warn you that if, if, if you decide to speak up later on, that will be publicly available on the internet. If you have any questions during the talk, uh, please post them in the chat. I will be reviewing them and then uh, read them out to, to Ian during the natural breaks that he said that there will be two during the talk and also uh, we can have a chat at the end of the at the end of the session uh, and I think that's it so please enjoy and Ian I'm handing over to you thank you thank you Kasper 
Um, so my name's Ian Russell. That's my Twitter handle, IJ Russell, at the bottom there. Um, and I do love F Sharp. I've been writing. Um, I've been writing software for 25 years, starting with uh, Delphi and VB6, and then C Sharp. And I can honestly say I've never been happier than the last few years writing F Sharp. So I'm I'm really happy. Um, we'll also say from this, it's not a silver bullet. So it won't solve all your problems. It's not perfect, but I like it. So, oops. so what I'm going to cover. First of all, I'm just going to do a quick bit on, on what F Sharp is for those people that don't know. And then the primary sort of thrust of the, of the talk will be, is functional programming good fit for DDD? So what is F Sharp? So F Sharp is a functional first language. That means it's not a pure functional language. It also supports imperative and object oriented programming as well. It's immutable by default. Um, so that means everything is, you, once something's written, you can't change it, but you can make it mutable by doing some extra work. It's all expression based rather than statements. Expressions return something. So everything in F sharp returns something. Um, it has structural equality all the way through. So those of you that are used to object-oriented programming and reference and reference equality, um, with objects you get reference equality, but most of the time with functional programming you get structural equality. So if two things look the same, they are the same. It's strongly typed. It doesn't appear like it's strongly typed some of the time, but it is completely strongly typed. And it uses composable types and functions. So you build, just like you just like you do with OO in a way. So you build bigger types out of smaller types, and you build more expressive and more useful functions out of smaller functions. And functions of first class citizens as well. The core difference between OOP and things like F sharp and functional programming is that state and behavior are two completely different things. So rather than having them as one thing that you're encouraged to do in object-oriented programming, in functional programming, you do it differently. So what you do is you, you create state and then you transform state within functions. And that's part of what functional programming is. So it's quick, that's what, function, that's what F sharp is. You'll see lots of code as we go through. Um, hopefully all of it will be relatively easy. Although the stuff that we're gonna look at at the end will get slightly more complex. I'm not expecting you to pick up and understand everything that I should show today. So is FP a good fit for DDD? Um, so this is an interesting one. Hopefully I'm going to answer this as we go through the as we go through the session. So there's been a lot of work over the last 10 years on on the modeling side. So we've got very good at actually being able to tease out from from the business and from from domain experts what they actually want. But there's still a massive gap between what the business wants and what we can actually deliver and what we can show them in code. Often you look at code that's been written and you can't compare the two. So you've got one thing that talks about um, talks about domain things like customers and users and orders. And you get into the code and you see lots of things like factories and 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 strategies and various other things. And it's not really a good fit. Hopefully some of the stuff you'll see with F sharp, it might be slightly different, might be slightly better. Um, readability is another one. Again, you know, a lot of the code that I see is very complex. There's lots of code in there. There's lots of there's lots of stuff that has to be there just to support the language. F sharp's quite a simple, and most functional languages are quite are quite um, but, but are quite terse. So there isn't a lot of extraneous noise there to. Uh, to um, to fill up the page, and the other one that's difficult as well. This because there's that gap between the between the domain experts and the coders and the people who write code. It's very hard to have shared knowledge. It's very it's very hard for somebody to to actually have their head in both camps. Now most coders will have their head in the code camp and see and see the um, the domain modeling side as well and have to learn that. But there are very few people on the domain modeling side that look at the code. I think that's 
potentially I w I won't say it's damaging, but it's it's not helpful. It would be nicer if if our domain experts could actually help us and look at the code and actually understand what's going on. It's it's a it's an aspiration. Let's call it that. We'll see if F sharp gets anywhere nearer to to my aspirations than uh, than than what you're looking at than what you're currently using. So we'll see. So I'm going to start off with a simple use case, little story. So we're going to apply a discount. So eligible registered customers get 10% discount when they spend £100 or more. And we've got some basic information. So we've got some people and, some, and we've got a, an is eligible flag as well. So when a customer spends a spend, then their total will be total. And we've got a, a little grid there. So there's some interesting words in there. So things like eligible, registered, customer, discount, um, spend, total. But there's one other thing there as well. There's a, um, look at the bottom of the page, we've got Sarah. Sarah's not registered, but it doesn't actually say anything about what she is. You know, there's no, there's no concept of, of, of what, you know, whether she's obviously not registered because she's not in the top list, but what is she? So. We'll have a look at how we can handle that. So what we're going to do is we're going to, to implement this in stages. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a record type. So this is an AND type. So a customer is a name, which is a string, an is registered flag, and an is eligible flag. I also have a little function signature. So calculate total is customer decimal decimal. So the way to read that is to say the thing that's on the right hand side after the last arrow is the return type and anything to the left of that are the, are the parameters that you pass in. So calculate total takes a customer and a decimal and returns a decimal. And then we've got a little function called calculate total and we're gonna use that type signature almost like an interface. So that's going to tell me that I've got, so customer is of type customer and that spend is of type decimal and that the result that comes out is of type decimal as well because it's because we're using the calculate total type with the capital. So it's a simple function. So we've got a simple um, inner function in there that works out the, the discount and we just calculate the rate so if they're registered and they're eligible and they spend greater than 100, then the discount is 10%, otherwise it's zero. Then to work out what the discount is, we, t we, t we multiply the rate by the spend. And then to work out what the total is in the end, we take the discount away from the spend. Relatively simple. But not very nice. I, I for one, don't like Booleans especially when they're, when they're representing real things in the domain. And most business people have no idea what decimal is. They might understand decimal in terms of currency, but not, um, not in terms of a data type. So it's not very useful. Um, also, we have a problem in that um, it's possible that I can have, I could switch, I could make it so that there is registered false and is eligible true. Now, in this case, it won't matter because I've covered both cases in the function. But if I hadn't done it, I'd have to write a test to know. So let's write some tests. By tests, I just mean some simple code to just say that it works. So if we create, so we create John. So John is named John, registered true, is eligible true. We create Mary, Richard, and Sarah as well. And then I've created a little helper function there. And all that's doing is, is so I can print out a result. So when I run my tests, I should end up with true, 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 true with the name in front of them all. OK. So if I ran this code, this is all runnable code. If I ran this, I'd see John true, Mary true, Richard true, Sarah true at the end of it. So let's try and make it a little bit better. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make, I want to get rid of that is registered flag and I want to make registered customer a real thing in the domain. So I'm gonna create a, a new type 
called registered customer. So this looks very much like the customer that I had previously. And yes, I just, I just renamed it and took out the is registered flag. But now I need to create another type. And this is something that if you're doing object oriented programming, you've probably never seen before. And this is called a discriminated union. This is an or type. So this is saying a customer can either be a registered customer or a registered of type registered customer or a guest, which has got, just got a string attached to it. So you can only be one or the other. It's a closed set. You can't be anything else. So you either registered or a guest. So it's made no difference to my calculate total um, signature helper. But then when I get into the calculate total function, what I've now done is I've used a pattern match. So it says match customer with, and now I can take the registered, and that C that goes with it is actually the customer. So I actually unwrap the customer by doing this. And then I can say when they're, they're eligible and the spend is greater than 100, make the discount 0.1. Otherwise, so the, the next line there, the, the vertical bar, and the underscore means it's a wild card, so anything else returns zero. So the only way to get my 10% discount is to be a registered customer and to be eligible and to spend greater than 100. And that funky little bit underneath at the bottom there that has a vertical bar and a greater than sign and the, and the brackets is just saying, pass the data from that match statement through to the next line and just multiply spend and that value together. So I've done effectively, so this does exactly the same as this. So spend star rate, that's exactly the same thing, so except instead of having the star in the middle, we've put the star as a prefix. So one of the things we can do with um, inside F sharp is we can turn certain inline functions like star, like times into a prefix by putting brackets around it. So that's simplified our code a little bit. But what impact has it had on our tests? Well, now to create a registered user, I need to create them like I did the. So you notice where I've got the pattern match. I'm not sure if I can highlight on this. I can't, can I? No, I don't think so. Sorry. No. Okay. I'm just trying to find where I am again. Right, so just like the pattern match where it goes match customer with, and it says registered C, when I create a customer, I have to do registered and then create the customer. And that's a type registered customer. So we'll go back to my my thing there. So my registered customer is a, is a, um, a record type with name and is eligible. So the first three are all registered, and the last one, guest, just takes a string. So that just takes the name. And then it's made a slight change to my to my uh, my helper function. So I need to handle all the cases. If I don't handle all the cases, it won't compile. I'll actually get a little squiggly line under the small where it says match customer with. That customer will actually have a, a squiggly line underneath it to say I haven't covered all the cases. So I have to cover registered and guest. So that's got is eligible in. Um, sorry, that's got registered in. What I want to do now is I want to make eligible um, a first class citizen as well. So to do that, I'm going to remove the is eligible flag from registered customer. And I'm going to add eligible as one of the types, one of the or types to customer. So I can either be eligible of a registered customer, registered as a registered customer, or a guest of, of string. So I'm one of the three. I can't be anything else. And in the match now, I can I can actually pattern match for 
I can test the customer for eligible. I don't care about the name, so I don't care about the uh, the instance that's in there. And I just check with the spend, return that, and that's exactly the same as before. So if I move on, on to the tests, it's made those slightly easier. So to make an eligible customer is relatively simple now, but it's made my little helper function slightly harder. So again, I've got to pattern match all of the cases. If I don't cover all of the cases, then so if I don't cover eligible, registered, and guest in some way, then it won't compile. So it gives me it gives me safety. So if I add a new type, I'll immediately know that it's I'll get a compile error and have to fix it. So the next one I want to do is I want to um, I want to get rid of those decimals. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a couple of type aliases. They don't add any protection. No, no. Um, they're still decimals, but it means that my calculate total signature now is a customer to spend to total, which is much more readable than it was previously. Doesn't impact anything else. Doesn't impact the the tests either. Don't need to do any changes to that. But that's but but with that simple change, it's made it much more readable. So the next stage is I want to get rid of that. Um, I want to make the customer name not a string. I want to make it a little more. Um, a little more um, readable, if you like. So I'm going to add a new type at the top called customer name. So it's a customer name of string. This is what they call a single case discriminated union. So it looks a little odd going customer name equals customer name of string. So that's the that's the binding type. So that's the that's the actual type of the thing, and that's the and the and the the customer name to the right of the equals sign is the constructor. It's just convention to use the same name. You could actually put anything in there, but it's convention to put the uh, the same name as the type. So what impact does that have? Well, I can go and add, I can now go and put my name in there, I've made that customer name. So it's no longer just a string. And the guest as well, I can make that a customer name. It means I can't just supply string now to the um, when I create these uh, when I create eligible customers, registered customers, and guests. I actually need to provide a customer name type rather than just a string. So if you look at the top line, I've still got an eligible customer and the name equals customer name and then the string John. So it's just a simple constructor. You see, it's the same all the way through. Um, it's made my um, it's made my helper function a lot more complicated, unfortunately. Although I could have simplified it by inlining it, but I chose not to. So what this let customer name? So the if you look at the the match statement, so it goes match customer with um, eligible C arrow. So that let customer name name is actually is actually um, unwrapping the name for me. So I can't just, I don't just have a string anymore. I actually have a customer name. So I need to unwrap it to get at the name. So that name now is now a string. So in the next line, the print function name is a string as, as shown by the, the percentage S on the, on the print statement. So that's quite complicated. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make it even more complicated. Um, what I want to do is eventually I want to have some some logic in there to stop you because customer name isn't just a string. There are obviously going to be some rules in there. You know, not you're not going to have you're not going to allow things like an empty string, for instance, and you're not going to allow probably a customer name that's that's a million characters long. So there's going to be some logic there. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend this a little bit. 
So I've now got a, um, a private constructor. So I can't now create a customer name directly. So what I'm going to do instead is I've created a little, little module called customer name that has a function called create and a function called value. So the create is obviously to create a customer name and value is to get the is to get the um, the unwrapped value out. The required qualified access is simply to say whenever you use create and value, you need to call it customer name dot create and customer name dot value. You can't just use create and value. So when we come to the tests, what I've got now is I use customer name dot create and I pass John in customer name dot create. And when it comes to getting the values out, I can use customer name dot value and the and the customer name that's passed in. So that's quite a lot in one quick go. Um, so what we've covered there is records. So records are and types. So if we go back to the customer, it was it was a customer name, an is eligible flag, and an is registered flag as well. So they require all of the fields to be set. Then we've got the discriminated union, which is or, which is the, pro the thing you've probably never seen before, which is the thing saying, if you're a customer, you are either eligible or registered or a guest. We also saw um, a type alias that just allows us to make code slightly more readable. And then we've got single case discriminated unions and these start to allow us to have type safety. So what they do is they stop us just passing any old string in. We have to pass something that, that actually matches what we want. So when we did customer name at the moment, we're not doing anything with it, but we can put some logic in there to say that customer name has to be has to be a string greater than zero length and can't be greater than a million characters. We also saw some pattern matching as well. Um, so the opposite of this, the, the, the companion of discriminated unions is pattern matching. So normally when you create a discriminated union, you're going to need to work on the data within it. So pattern matching is the thing that helps us with that. We have incrementally improved the design from where we started off with. We've got something that's much more readable. When I read the code now, when I look at that code, that's much more along the lines of um, what I was trying to to get from the code that from the um, from the feature and the use case that I was given initially. So this is a natural breaking point. Are there any questions at this point? I, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I think we can go ahead. Okay. Um, so what we've covered so far are the building blocks of everything that we work with. So, so if you understand records and discriminated unions and particularly pattern matching, they're the real building blocks of working with F Sharp. Okay, so I'll, I'll move on then. So what I want to do now is I want to have a look at a, um, a shopping cart. And I have a look a little bit of logic from, uh, from this and how we handle it. So we've got, at the top of the page, we've got um, a single case discriminated union, which is a product code. So rather than storing a string, we say it's got to be a product code. So we have an item, which is a product code of type product code and a quantity, which is an int. We'll fix that at some point. Um, we've then got a concept of an active cart, which is a, a list of items and a completed cart, which is also a list of items. I've made this really simple. So there isn't a load of extraneous, there isn't a load of extra stuff in this. We're just going to be look at the, looking at the items in this case. So a shopping cart is either, it's either empty or it's active of type active cart or it's completed 
of type completed cart. And then there are four, um, four functions really that I want to run against this. And they are, I want to be able to add an item. So adding an item, it's, you take a shopping cart, you add an item, and you get a shopping cart back out. Removing an item is start with a shopping cart, take an item out, and you return a shopping cart. Clear items, you start with a shopping cart and you finish with the shopping cart, and the same for complete as well. Although you could say that they're slightly more, you can go down to a slightly lower level than that. So if we took um, clear items, for instance, obviously clear items, you start with an active cart and you finish up with an empty cart. For complete, you start with an active cart and you finish with a completed cart. But for add an item, you start with either an empty cart or an active cart and you finish up with an active cart. And remove an item, you start with an active cart and you finish with either an empty cart or an active cart. So they're the options that we have there. Um, so at the bottom, I've created a brand new cart, which I've, I've made empty. And then I've created um, an active cart, but with a, a list that's empty. Now, I shouldn't really be able to do this because that's an empty cart to me. So I need to find some way of, of um, stopping this happening. I need to find some way of, of making it so that I can never have an empty list in an active cart. So obviously I could put it in a function, but I don't want to do that. What I want to do is to put it into the type system in some way so that I can't, I can't ever end up with that with situation anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new type. I'm going to add a new non-empty list. So a non-empty list, and then we get the bracket tick T and close bracket. The tick T part is a generic. So this is a non-empty list of anything of a specific type in this case. But so we're going to we're going to have a non-empty list of items. So an active cart now is a non-empty list of items. So let's have a look at what uh, what that does. Well, it doesn't do anything to new cart, but let's have a look at empty active. I can't now, so a non-active, a non-empty list has an item and a list of, a potentially an empty list of other things, which is what I've got there. But I can have a quantity zero, which is the same as having an empty list. So actually I'm in no better state now than I was when I started, because I can still have the equivalent of an empty list in an active cart, which is wrong. So what I can do is I can go to my um, single case discriminated union. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a new one for quantity. So I'm going to make quantity a, a new single case discriminated union of, of quantity of type int. And what I've done here is I've said if the quantity, so I've, I've created a little module and I've created a function called try create, and I put try in front because um, that tells me that it may not work. So it could work, it might not work, I don't know. Um, so in this case, if the input is less than or equal to zero, then I'm going to raise an exception. And if it doesn't, then I'm just going to do what I did before, which is just create a quantity, and the value part's exactly the same as before. So the impact that has is at the bottom of the page, if I try to do that now, what I actually get is an exception. So it will not let me create an active cart with a quantity of zero. So I don't need to test for this anymore, because or particularly in, in, in that part anyway, because I handle it in the type system, which is quite a powerful thing. But, Exceptions may not be the best thing to use in this case. Um, so I, I really take exceptions for things that are exceptional rather than rather than handling business logic. 
I'd rather I'd rather have a a a more lightweight approach to handling this rather than an, an exception. But there are other situations where this happens as well. So these are all sort of related, although it doesn't appear to be at the moment. So if we take we take the first example, the customer name. So you've got a first name, middle, and a last. Not everybody has a middle name. So what do we use instead of, at the moment, that's a string, which is OK, because null is a member of string, in, certainly in .NET. But I, don't, I certainly don't want to use null. Um, so we, we try to avoid null as much as possible. There's sometimes where it's unavoidable when dealing with, um, with external code in particular. But as far as F sharp is concerned, we try not to use null at all. So we need to come up with something better than that. And in the second case, the um, the date the date time try pars, we can't use null anyway. So if we do date time try try pars, what we've got there is a is a tuple of of bool and date time. So success is a boolean, so it's, it's true or false, and then the value is a date time. And if you pass in something that doesn't pass properly into date time, what you get back out is date time dot minimum, which may or may not be okay, but I'd like a little bit more control over this. And finally, the last one. Um, so I've created a little list. So try get user, pass in the username. I've got a little list of users, and then I do a list dot find based on the username. So if I do a search for Ian, that's fine. I get a user back. But if I do a search for Fred, what I'll actually do is a key not found exception. And again, that's not a very nice, nice thing for me to do. So what I'd like is something that's more lightweight than exceptions, but more expressive than null, and more more universally applicable than null. And Something that we have in, in F sharp is called the option type. So this is a discriminated union, again, really simple. So it's an option of, of tick T, so it's a generic type again. So this takes anything, it will take any any type that you've got as a as a parameter. And what you are, you are either sum of T. So if it's a if it's an option of string. In the case of customer name, it would be sum of string, or it'd be none. And what that means is any time we want to, to pass this value around, we need to test for whether it's sum or none. So it's almost like a null check, but it's much more, it's much more elegant than a null check. So if I add that to my customer name, I can do it either as an option of string or there's a slightly more readable version built into, into F sharp, which is just to call it string space option, which is slightly more readable. So let's try and use that then with those, um, those examples on the previous page. So we do the date ties, the date time pass, first of all. So we wrap it in a little function, we pass in the string, we try it so we get the success and value. If it's success, then we turn sum of value, else we return none. So if I pass in a valid date time, I get out sum and the date time. And if I pass in an invalid one, I get none. And in the case of the, um, the try get user, what I do here is if it's if it works successfully, I return sum of user. And if it doesn't work, I get none. So that's that's all built into um, all built into F sharp. But I still don't like this last one. I, I really don't like having the um, trying and and, um, and catching the exception. So because option is something that's built in, one of the things that you'll find is lots of the functions have, particularly the, the collection functions, have um, a try version, and that automatically returns an option for you. So instead of me having to manage it, I can let the I can let that do it itself. So try find will either return some of 
the user if it can find it or none. So that's okay. Um, and certainly that works for lots of cases. But we then got the, the other side with what happens if um, I need to get information back out again. So if we go back to that, um, the example with the quantity, for instance, what happens if I wanted to know why it failed? So with the option, I can't, I get none back on the failure side. So we need, we need to use something else that gives us that information. And that again is built into, into F sharp and, and most functional languages, although it might be called something slightly different. So this is, um, this is the result type. Again, it's a discriminated union. So it's either okay or error. So it's a result of success or failure. So it's okay of success or it's an error of failure. So it must be either one or the other. So the result is either okay or error. So how does that work? Let's have a look. So I've created a little error type here at the top called get used to error. And I've just, I've just called this user not found. So in my try get user function, what I've now got is it takes a string as input and returns a result of user or get user error. So the signature of the function is telling me what's going to happen. So it's telling me that, that if I pass a string in, I will either get a result, or I'll get a result back that's either okay user or error of some kind of get user error. So I run through this and I get my error of user not found in this case. So again, they're two really powerful things. So, so the option type really is there to replace nulls or unknowns. So the option is some or none. And the result type is to handle um, where things start to go wrong, particularly business errors. So I'm certainly not saying never use exceptions. There are certainly a whole range of exceptions that you should never, ever wrap up this way. You should just handle them separately. You should handle them as you normally do. But that's up for you to decide. It's up to you to decide whether it's whether you get more value by wrapping it up in the type or whether you get more value from raising the exception. But the option is there for you to do it. Okay, so let's have a look at how we use, or we can use things like option in a slightly more complicated case. So this is a simple um, contact. So I've got a record type again, and it takes a contact ID, a phone number, and an email address. But not everybody has a phone, and not everybody has an email address. So I need to handle this. So, so maybe if we turn this around and say, we want one of them. So we'd like to have either a phone number or an email address, or both, maybe. So the first thing we could try is try options. But that doesn't work, because phone number could be none, and email address could be none. So that's a non-starter. So the next thing to look at would be to say, well, how about if I wrap these things up in a discriminated union and have a choice of email and phone number? And that's what we do now. So we create a brand new type called contact info that's either an email or a phone. And then I can have a primary contact info, which, which you have to supply, and a secondary contact info, which is an option. So that's one way of doing this. Another way is to use something that we saw a little bit earlier, which is the non-empty list. So my contact infos could be a non-empty list of contact info. So I know there must always be a contact info and there can be a 
an unending list, if you like. So if you've if you've got lots of potential contact types, this might be a better approach. Because on the other one, you, you if you wanted another contact info, you'd have to have another item in there with an option, or you'd have to turn secondary contact info into a list of some kind. Okay, um, any questions at this point, Casper? Not in the chat, but I do have one question. Okay. Uh, so what would be the types of exceptions that you would raise and you would wrap in like a result type or an option type? Um, any business rules and anything that you think that you could handle yourself. But there are a whole series of things like, um, there are obviously things that are absolutely catastrophic that you certainly wouldn't want to. So things like running out of memory, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Um, and then there's a middle ground where there are things that you expect that are going to happen. So things like if you're connecting to a database or even things like um, connecting to um, a website, connecting to a, an API client, for instance, you know, what do you do on things like unauthorized um, timeouts on, um, I don't know, maybe 404, you know, are there things that you can recover from? Are there things that you'd want to, to do anything with? You know, there's, there's, there's a big gray area in the middle of, okay. of things where, where sometimes it makes sense to do it one way and sometimes it makes sense to, to not do it that way. Mm -hmm. So it's, so it's, it's entirely, it's entirely up to any, certainly any business error, any, any bit of business logic that says, you know, if I've got an if statement in there, then I expect this to happen. Wrap that up, definitely. Okay. Yeah, don't throw and, an exception for that. Right, and the things that are, that are more related to the runtime, they might be more reasonable to throw them and let them, you know, something else. Yes, I mean, if you can't do anything with it, then it seems pretty pointless wrapping it up. Yeah, you might as exactly. well throw it and let something else handle it that's, that's further up the chain. Mm -hmm. There's there's no perfect answer to this, but it's um, you know certainly you don't you don't wrap everything up as a as a result. That would be that would be nonsensical. But you, the, the, you know it's 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 it, again it's a judgment call. None of this is hard and fast. None of this none of this that we're talking about is is if there were a perfect way of doing everything, there'd be one book. We'd all read the book. We'd all write perfect code, and there'd be no That's problems. Right. It's it doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Right. So, the, the, sorry. Any more? No. No. Just, no, just want, to, just want to say that, that that's it. We can carry on. Just. Okay. So I'll move on to the um, the next part now. Then. So we'll have a look at. Um, I talked earlier about structural equality. So if two things look the same, they are the same. So if we take a record type of user, that's a username and a password. So I create three users two of which have got the same data and one hasn't. If I compare one to two and two to three, one and two are, are the same and two and three aren't. So that's, that's structural equality. So if two things look the same, they are the same. Um, but obviously we have a problem here because entities have IDs of some kind and this obviously won't work for that so can we deal with with entities and obviously the answer to that is yes but but how do we deal with it so what we have to do is we have to to um, use some attributes and override a couple of functions on object so we have to override equals and get hashed code. So it's relatively simple to do, but it does mean a little bit of extra work and it's not as clean as just a, a, a perfectly clean record. And what that now means is that if I use the same three users that I used previously, they're all equal because they match on the, on the username, which is what we want. 
There's also something called no equality as well. So you can you can say that you can't use equality at all. And that way you have to write your own comparison stuff. Which may or may not be what you want. So that's sort of the end of the of the, the main part of the talk. What I've um, what I've done though is I've got some some extra bits in there because um, obviously what we've done is we've got a we've got a lot more um, extra bits in here. So things like option and and um, and result. So when we when we talked about composing functions. When you compose functions, you've got to make sure that the the output of one function matches the input of the next function. And we've now gone and started making things with sum and none and with results of, of OK and error. And we don't want to go and have to go around and rewrite all of our functions so that they've got um, so that um, they can support this. But thankfully, all this is actually built in to the language. So we already have helpers that allow us to to do all this matching up for us in in a in a way that's it's not magical because it is just functions they're, they're actually quite simple functions but it allows us to tie things together so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go through a a um an example that's taken from a from a um an f sharp library so what um what this is is just some pseudo code so we've got four functions and we've got a and a final function called login so login takes two strings which in this case is a username and a password and returns an async result of auth token and login error so async is exactly what you think it is it's the asynchronous wrapping that we use in f sharp and then we've got a result of auth token and log error login error rather and what we're going to do is we're going to use the four functions above so the try get user is password valid, authorize and create auth token and combine them together for this login function. And if you look at the inputs and the outputs on this, they're um, all over the place. So we're gonna have a look and see how complicated this is gonna get. This is what we end up with. So first thing I need to do is I need to create my errors. So obviously I have um, I have a couple of errors already. So authorize has an auth error and create auth token has a token error. But what I want to do is I want to create an error type, which is a discriminated unit again, a choice, just for the login. And I want to reuse the errors that we've got from the other functions. So I can use, so those four functions are completely standalone and they can be used in other functions as well. So what I don't want to do is to tie those four functions to, to what I'm doing in, in login. So what we can do is we create a new type called login error and we're gonna say, if there's an error for try get password, uh, try uh, get user, that's going to be an invalid user error. Um, if there's an error for, so if the password isn't valid, it's going to be invalid password. And then we've created unauthorized if there's an auth error raised from the create auth, auth token function, uh, sorry, from the authorized function. And then there's going to be a token error for the create auth token function if there's an error from that. So what that does, so we end up with a login function that takes a username and a password and returns an async of result of auth token and login error. Um, I'm not really going to go into what the async result thing is with the bracket. That's called a computation expression. Um, that's what's doing a lot of the magic that allows you to tie all of this together. So what we've got is a is a function that says let the user be we pass the username to the get user function, try get user function. And then we use the async result dot require sum. 
So what this does is it says if it's sum and it's required to be sum, that's okay. If it's not, then make it an error and make it a type of invalid user. So we get the user from that. We then pass the user into the is password valid function with the password that's been passed in. And in this case, we require that the, the result is true. So the, pa the password must be valid. So it must match. And if it's not, we raise an invalid password error. The next line, we pass the user into the authorized function. And this map error function is required to because we've got what we what we get from the create sorry what we get from the authorized function is an auth error and what we actually want is an unauthorized error so what this is doing is mapping the error that i get from the function to the required error type and the same for the last one the great thing about this is if it fails on the first line it won't run or won't appear to run any of the, the rest of the code. So all of the code that you've got requires that everything turn, turns an OK. So as soon as you get an error, everything goes on the error track. So as soon as you're on an error, so if you get an error from the from the username, sorry, from the, the try get user as an invalid user, what you'll get out of it is a result of invalid user. So an error invalid user coming out of it. So the reason that I wanted to show this really was to say, you know, we've even though it looks like we're we're adding lots of extra stuff in, there is stuff built into F sharp. And it looks quite complicated at this stage because it's brand new. It's just different from what you've seen before. But there's not much of it. And actually, they're all simple functions. So none of these functions are more than four or five lines long. You know, it's just a case of, of trying to, to get your head around how some of these things actually work. So I'm going to to avoid the next couple for the moment. Right. So what we've covered in this session is, well, some of the things that we've got from F sharp. So the and types, so we've met records and tuples. And we met, we've met a lot of discriminated unions, including options and results, and single case discriminated unions and type aliases. We've met quite a bit of pattern matching as well. Um, when, once you start writing functions, you'll make pattern matching even more. We met composition, so composing types and functions together and equality as well. Um, so that thing that I asked at the start, so is functional programming a good fit for DDD? I think it is. I think it's quite an interesting, I think it's quite an interesting approach. So things like discriminated unions give me features that I just don't have in other in other styles of programming. You can approximate it in in um, object oriented programming, but it's not as it's not as clean and as tidy as a discriminated union. So where can I learn more? Um, so the so the my favourite website on the internet is F Sharp for Fun and Profit by Scott Voloshin. Um, it's a fabulous site. There's an absolute ton of stuff in there on on all things F Sharp. And he does a lot of function. He does a lot of domain modeling. He's also written a book, which is what that uh, that image is. So domain modeling made functional. If you haven't read it, buy it. It's it's a really good book. It's a really interesting read. Um, he goes through most of the stuff that I've covered today and more, and also covers domain driven design at the start as well. And I've written a a series of blog posts on an introduction to functional programming in F Sharp, which looks at some of the things that we looked at today, but goes into it much more slowly than we've done today. Um, obviously, I've tried to give you a flavor of what's possible and what's not today, rather than uh, rather than cover um, everything. So it's a, it's a non-exhaustive list. And that's the end of my 
presentation. So we have one question that's from Mokhtar. And so the question is that right now I'm trying to model the entities in my business using F sharp types. One of the challenges that I'm thinking about is how to structure a big project using F sharp. Are there any pointers, resources to help with that? Background, I'm using the clean architecture with C sharp. Um, have a look at the code from domain modeling made functional. So there's a there's a code base that Scott wrote on on this. What what lots of people do is um, is you split your code into in basically into bounded context. So you'd have a module for each bounded context. Sorry, you'd have you'd have generally sorry. Start again. You generally split it up into into bounded context, and then you'd have um, often two files. So you end up with a types file and a functions file for each of those bounded contexts. And that tends to separate them. And then within those, you can have modules within each one of those pages as well. So you can extend it further down than, than that. So, so one of the problems that we have is that there aren't many exemplar programs out there of a large scale F-sharp project. Most of the examples are quite small. They might be single file. There are very few that have got more than one file, and certainly very few that have got more than more than ten files. But certainly, one of the ways of doing it, as I said, is to split it into into um, into bounded context, and then have one file for types and one file for functions, and that seems to work quite well. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there are other other ways that have that have done it. We we tend to mix and match. Sometimes we do that, sometimes we don't. Okay. Again, it's, uh, it's obviously F sharp slightly different in that it's a top down language. So, you know, you've got uh, everything within a file gets compiled from the top down. So if it's not been, if you've not mentioned something, if you've not created a type previously in the, in the project, it, it's not there. So, so that sort of drives some of what we're doing anyway. So it's not it's not alphabetically ordered. It's it's ordered in in order of of how things get used, and then obviously program at the bottom, you know, your entry point. It'd be nice actually yeah. if somebody wrote um, a blog post on this, on how to um, on sensible ways of structuring a large scale app, because it is a question that lots of people do ask. And then the next question is, are there examples of large scale apps that we can look at? Just like there is in DDD, everybody says, where's the example of a DDD application? I did to say that maybe that's going to be your next blog post in the series. Um, possibly. I might have a chat with a few other people first, though, and see what um, see if we can come up with a, a consensus as an idea. Because I've I've not seen I've, I've not seen anything outside of what I what I explained really you know I know I know other people try slightly different things we've got some we've got a couple of different ways of doing it I'm not sure which is uh, which is better but certainly it's 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 one of those things where I think it's better if there's an idiomatic way of doing it that everybody then follows because if you're always used to seeing everything split up into into nice little sections of having customer dot types and customer dot functions and user dot types, user dot functions, it's very easy to follow. So one of the problems that I have with with particularly things like C sharp and and Java is is how big these projects are, how many files there are. Without an IDE, it's quite difficult to work your way around sometimes. Whereas F sharp projects tend to be, by their nature, quite smaller, be quite small because of the um, the terseness of the language and the um, and the I don't know the the lack of noise, the lack of the lack of um, the the fact that you can put more than one thing into a file. So yeah, I can't offer more than that. I'll I'll, I'll have a chat with a couple of other people. I might I might end up writing something like that because it is definitely missing. Thank you for giving me extra work. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Okay, I just changed the setting of the Zoom call. So if you want to join the discussion or have any questions, you can unmute yourself now. So feel free to join. Uh, so just want to ask if there are any other questions. 
And if not, I wanted to thank you, Ian, for the presentation. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions about the slides. <laughs> so uh, if you can share them so uh, somewhere. Can, can, yeah, I'll, I'll put the slides on uh, on GitHub. Perfect. Then I, I can tweet, a, tweet them from the from the DDD London account. And... Okay, I'll um, I'll put the code up there as well. So I've got a I've got a project with all the uh, all the code in it as well. So I did a copy and paste of all of that. Appreciate it. Yeah, and the recording worked as well. So if anyone needs to catch up, uh, then it will be available on YouTube shortly. So that's a good news. Okay. If there are no further questions, then thank you everyone and hopefully see you soon. Uh, I'm playing another meetup that I think that's going to be just a, like a, you know, a discussion or like a link coffee format where we can just all come to the room and have a chat with each other. So have a look at meetup.com uh, for, for the announcements. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>